songs. Uh, I hope that, uh, you know, they're our neighbours and we haven't even heard them beating their drum yet, so uh, they're very quiet up there in the hill. Uh, I don't think Dave is ready to ride, cycle a bicycle yet, but uh, hopefully we'll get on that at some stage. Um, I just wanted to ask whether there are any testimonies. Has anybody got a testimony that they'd like to share with us that's happened over this period? Anybody? No. Oh, come Gussie. Great. Not really a testament. It's just, I was on a close drive today for COVID. Uh, you know that we think that COVID is something that comes against us. In the meantime, it's God who is in control of the entire situation. As we were praying this morning. You know, let's not look at the negativity of the things around us. Let's look at the positivity of what God is, has in store for us. This is a time for revival. Amen. Amen. Takes you a long time. Eh? <laughs> this is a time for revival. I believe there's going to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our community, in our nation, and our nation will be healed. That's why all these bad things come out now. Uh, the government servant, what they've been doing, what they've been stealing, the corruption, um, whatever. It's, been it's coming out now because God is revealing it. And there's going to come an end to that. So, not a testimony, but I want to say I want to encourage you um, say any prayer this morning. There's a river of God flowing. Get into the river. Don't stand on the bank and, and watch what's going past you. Get into the river because God is going to do a miraculous thing. I, be, I, I want you to believe, as, us as a congregation, that in our church, God is going to do a miraculous thing. Amen. That miraculous thing will be an outpouring of the Spirit and a revival. No, amen. amen. Come on, man. Amen. <laughs> Sherry, great. Just while Sherry's coming up, I just wanted to say I want to uh, also say welcome to the two new members of our church, Colton and Joshua. Oh, so yeah. exciting, yeah. 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 And they're both here today, so that's awesome. Sherry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, basically take the opportunity to give glory and thanks to God for the fact that we've managed to keep that virus out of Lincoln Haven all these months. Um, and it, it cannot possibly be from our own efforts because we're only human. Um, it's been hard, but God has been gracious and he has definitely had his hand on it. So he's spared us the stress of having to keep people separated and all the things that are involved. Um, so I just want to give him the glory today because yeah. honestly he's had his hand on Lincoln Haven and we are just so grateful. Yeah. So please continue to pray for Lincoln Haven. We're not through it yet. Okay, thank you. Amen. Amen. Right. Um, you know, it, it's, it's so good when you just know because you know because you know that God is speaking. And mm. you know, at the, about a year ago, as a leadership we met and we discussed what are we going to do in 2020? What is our theme going to be? And you'll remember that we came up with the Go series. And it was really that each one of us is to go out into the community and be Jesus, really, to people that don't know him. And we had no idea that there was going to be a COVID epidemic and that we'd all be stuck at home and, you know, there'd be this negativity and that this was a, a, an opportunity for us to be that. Um, and, and that the, the, the Go series has actually been quite amazing because we've had to have online church, which has taken it to people's homes. And when they've had family, uh, family have been able to watch, and it's actually, we, we've reached probably a lot more people than you realize. Um, we've been looking at the, the number of people who have been uh, looking at our, our um, services, and I was talking to Jochen, um, you remember Jochen, he was here for about a year, some years back, and he now runs the uh, Waterfall Church, and I had a coffee with him this week. And I was just sharing with him how many people have been watching our, our services, and he said, gee, Dave, that's amazing. He said, that's far more than we're getting. And I thought, isn't that amazing? I, I thought, you know, our little church is getting more hits than the Waterfall, so well done, guys. <laughs> you know? So 
Anyway, with, with, with the Go series, I was praying, I'm thinking, well, Lord, we, we started off this year with, with the Go series um, as a series. Where do you want us to go now? What, 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 what is it that you want us to, to uh, do? Because last year, you remember, we did the John series, which was quite a successful series. And it just came on to my heart that we needed to do James. And uh, as you read James, you realize how it ties in so well with the series on Go for 2020. So I've entitled this morning uh, my, my introduction, it's not really a sermon, it's, it's more of an introduction to, to James, as just go and do it. Um, I was going to just, uh, you know, just do it from Nike, and then I thought, no, no, it's just go and do it. Okay, um, so let's close our eyes. Lord, we just thank you that we can be together again this morning. We thank you that... Uh, even when we don't know where you are going to take us, Lord, you know. And you know what you want each one of us to do in this community as your, as your disciples, as your hands and feet. And you know, Lord, that you have a unique calling for each one of us, an individual unique thing that you have called us to do. And it's something that nobody else can do. And we ask, Lord, that in our quiet time, we would hear you calling our name. And you would be clear about what it is that you want us to do. And that we would rise up and do it. Use us, Lord, we pray. And we thank you. That we can be in the story. In the purpose that you have for each one of us individually. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we're going to talk about Jacob this morning. Um, I don't know how many of you know that uh, actually James' name was Jacob, uh, and it was anglicized to James. Um, it's a different letter, a, a different epistle, in that it was probably one of the first written um, that was included in the, in the New Testament, and probably one of the last to be included in the New Testament. And so we're going to be looking at this book over the next five or six weeks, uh, Gus will be starting off really with the sermons next week. So this is really just a, 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 an introduction. But what I want to say to you this morning is I encourage you to please read James. To read through the book of James. You know it's a very short book and it's a very easy book to read. So this morning I want to ask you to raise your hands if you commit that you're going to read James. Thank you. Okay, I just think that if you want to get the most out of this series, it's advisable that you do read James. Okay, so let's look at verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, and that's all I'm going to actually be reading this morning, is this. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. That's it. So, what do we get just from verse 1? We gather that it's a letter and that it is written by James. We gather that it's written by James, although his name was Jacob, and that he's addressing himself as a bond servant. And if you look at the Greek, it's translated from doulos, which actually is a bond slave. So that shows to us that James is bonded, bonded to something or committed to something. And he recognizes that he has been bought. As a slave, you've been bought. And the reference to the Lord Jesus Christ back in its day was a recognition that Jesus Christ was in fact God. He is writing to the scattered tribes in other words, those Jews that have been dispersed. Dispersed back then, just like very often the Jews have been through history, through persecution, or through seeking work or business opportunities. Very much as we know the history of the Jews. So it's a letter from James to the Jews, written specifically to the Jews, remember, because it was the early Christian church. It was before the Gentiles had really been part of the church. 
So it's mostly made up of the Jews before the spread to the Gentiles. And it was the Jews who had left and were scattered around the Mediterranean. They'd actually left Israel and they'd scattered around the Mediterranean because they'd been persecuted and they were looking for business opportunities. So today, we're going to be starting off with the James, and I'd just like to make reference to David Pawson, one of my favorite uh, guys, because I use his material quite a lot, and he's a well-known author, speaker, and prominent Bible teacher. And he wrote Unlocking the Bible, and if you are interested in uh, learning about the Bible, I would always suggest getting Unlocking the Bible by David Pawson. It's a very useful tool. And much of uh, what I say today comes from that book. So I'm going to quote David uh, Pawson right now. There are two particular difficulties in studying scripture. One is mental difficulty, when you don't understand what you're reading. And the other is moral difficulty, when you do understand it. More people have moral difficulties than mental difficulties. And if ever a book is likely to give the former, it is James. It is a frightening book, because once you've read it, you can't plead ignorance. It's one of the easiest books in the Bible to understand, and one of the hardest to undertake. So, to start the series, let's have a look at the five points that I want to cover this morning. Who is this guy, James? What's his sort of writing style? Who was he writing to? What was he writing about? And why is his letter relevant to us today? It is a no-nonsense Christianity for daily living. And the emphasis in his book or his letter is on the word do. Hence, I've used the title, Just Go and do it. If you're anything like me, there's few things that irritate me more than people who have big talk, great intentions, incredible dreams, and no action. When you speak of them, or when they speak about what they're going to do, what comes to mind to me is, oh yeah, I'll believe that when it happens. Fortunately, there's no one here like that. The people like that didn't come to church this morning. <laughs> so, we'll tell them. We'll tell them. So James is talking about action and not just listening. In other words, just go and do it. This letter is more focused, uh, sorry, not, not so focused on doctrine, but more focused on action and challenges us to be doers and not just hearers of the word. I would like to say it's a very appropriate book again for this year, 2020, with the Go theme. Interestingly, church leaders like Martin Luther criticized James because there was no reference really to Jesus and very little reference to the Gospels. And the emphasis was mostly on man's activities. He felt that there was a bit of a conflict between our salvation being works rather than being in faith. And he questioned why, in fact, it was included in the New Testament. In fact, when he wrote the New Testament himself, he put James as an appendix. I'm sure, hopefully, by the end of this uh, series, that you will see exactly why it is included in the New Testament and the importance of it. And I've spoken to quite a few people who've told me that James is one of their favorite books. So who is this guy, James? Although there are five Jameses mentioned in the New Testament, it is widely accepted that this James who wrote the epistle was the half-brother of Jesus. Half-brother because he had the same mother, Mary, but he didn't have the same father as Jesus because his father was Joseph, as was all of the siblings of Jesus's, whereas as we know, Jesus' father was God. He was the son of God. It is interesting to note that two of the four brothers, or half-brothers, of Jesus became New Testament writers. Um, there was Judas, and there was Jacob. Judas was Jude, as we know him, 
and Jacob is James. And they're the two who wrote in the New Testament. And although they wrote in the New Testament, there was no reference to Jesus. Um, they, they, they were not name droppers. They didn't use Jesus so that people would listen to them. They didn't use the fact that Jesus was our brother, that we share the same mother, so that people would listen. In fact, it was James who called himself a bondservant, humble. And in fact, it was Jude who referred to himself, when he wrote, as the brother of James. No reference to Jesus, also humble. Having grown up and living under the same roof as Jesus and uh, as, as brothers in a modest cottage somewhere in, in uh, Nazareth, it is interesting that the brothers didn't grow up as believers. And they did not recognize Jesus as the Son of God until after his resurrection. And the scriptures say in John 7 verse 5, for even his brothers did not believe in him. Can you imagine growing up with 30 odd years with a brother in your home and then suddenly he's claiming that he's the son of God. I uh, didn't have brothers or sisters, I'm an only child, but I did have a stepbrother and a stepsister. Uh, Nigel, who I, I love as a brother and uh, who comes and stays with us very often from Norway and some of you have met him, and I just thought that I would just share this. When when I was brought up with, with Nigel in the home, I was at boarding school and I used to spend half my holidays with my dad and half the holidays with my mom. And my dad obviously was married to Nigel's mother. And when I was away from our home, every time I came back, my motorbike was empty of petrol. <laughs> and I can tell you that Nigel absolutely denied that he stole my petrol or that he rode my motorbike. And I can honestly tell you that he only admitted this quite recently. In fact, when we'd moved into this area, and I was having a beer with him at Vans, and he eventually admitted that he had stolen the petrol from my mother. So I can relate totally with James about not believing that a brother could be the son of God. I think it's quite believable, and you can understand the skepticism that those brothers had, um, and the mocking that it is in the Bible, that uh, they did mock Jesus, um, and I think it is pretty understandable just from my experience of brothers. I can, I can identify with them. It was only after Jesus died and it appeared to the disciples and showed himself to about 500 people that he eventually went and showed himself to James. And it was at this time that James really realized who Jesus was. Because you see, James would have witnessed and seen Jesus being beaten, Jesus being crucified, and Jesus being buried, and a huge big rock put over his tomb. So his sudden appearance to James after all of that was pretty convincing. James was obviously not one of the 12 disciples. However, he became the leader of the mother church in Jerusalem, and he's credited to have held the church together during a time that could have split the church in two. The issue being whether the Christian church, led by Jews at the time, should in fact include Gentiles. A contentious issue. It was James' understanding of the Word and of the Holy Spirit that gave him the wisdom and the judgment upon which everyone agreed. And, it, and not only did they agree to not split the church, but to include the Gentiles, but it actually united the church. He had a few nicknames, one of which was Titch. And uh, I thought I would just add this for the benefit of Jen, who doesn't remember very much, um, <laughs> that she can remember this uh, nickname Titch because our son's nickname is Titch. You see, he's Thomas Hitch, T Hitch, Titch. <laughs> So, no reference to him being a small guy, whereas James was a small guy. So he had the nickname Titch, not that it's related to my son Thomas at all. James also had the nickname Just, James the Just, and was known to be reliable and honest. Sadly, however, following the death of the Roman uh, governor Festus uh, in AD 62, when Christians 
were growing in influence and were a bit of a threat to the Jews, there was a two-month period when Festus died where there was no governor. And it opened the door for the Jews to persecute the Christians. And it was during this time of persecution that some Jewish rulers seized this opportunity to capture James and throw him from the pinnacle of the temple, the same pinnacle that Jesus was uh, tempted by Satan. And he was thrown off there uh, because he refused to blaspheme against Jesus. And it is recorded, although he fell from that temple, he was not killed. And he landed down with broken bones, motionless, and he, people started to, to, to stone him. And uh, even with all of that happening, he was still praying, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Quite incredible, huh? Until one of the Jews took pity on him and clubbed him to death to end his pain. When Christians came to fetch his body, they saw that his knees were calloused like camels. And he got another nickname, Camel Knees. Here was a small man who spent hours on his knees praying that God forgive the Jews for what they did to Jesus. What a tragedy to face a similar cruel fate as Jesus did, a mindless, unjust end to a believer who had displayed godliness and who had left a legacy as the most just of men. His style of writing. James' style of writing catches one's attention. James was obviously a talented uh, writer and he used some very clever techniques. He used rhetorical questions. Questions that don't need an answer, but made you think. He used uh, paradoxical statements to gain attention, like, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials. Difficult to marry this joy with pain. I just want to take a little thing here. You know, I, was, I woke up last night, and uh, I was thinking of asking Mary, sitting here, whether in fact Gus had callous knees from the brain. And then I thought, you know, as I was going along this train of thought, you know, Gus must have callous knees. I haven't seen him in shorts. But what would he be praying about? And I thought, well, he'd probably be praying, thank the Lord for Mary. Amen. And then I thought, is there any relation to the joy in the trial there? I wasn't sure. Anyway, just a sideline. But it's difficult to marry joy with pain. And he creates imagery that is like a conversation and a dialogue, knowing that people like to overhear things from other people. They like to know what's going on when other people speak. And so you know the people that uh, I, I detest, and I think I've mentioned it before, those people that sort of shoulder surf, you know? You're talking to them and they're looking over there at somebody else and trying to hear what they're saying and they're not listening to you those sort of people. So, the people that are sussing out what's happening behind you. He introduces new subjects with a question and he includes strong language by using uh, imperatives like, be warned. He addresses his audience by, direct, by directly saying to them, you, which gets their attention and was not afraid of using harsh and direct language either. He used images or pictures from daily life like uh, ships, and rudders, and forest fires to describe the power of the tongue. Who was he actually writing to? Number three. We've already established that he was addressing the 12 tribes who were the scattered Jews among the nations. The Jews had spread around the Mediterranean and it was interesting to note the timing of Jesus coming to earth. When the Jews had dispersed and settled around the Med, at a time where more Jews were outside of Israel than actually in Israel, that was the exact time that Jesus came and the ideal time for the gospel to be spread and for it to be spread rapidly. What was he writing about? This is uh, the interesting bit. Well, he was writing about wealth. A few things I'm going to mention, but one of them is wealth. And why, why wealth? Well, you know, the Jews 
have always been seeking wealth, money, and uh, so it was an important subject to them. Many Jews have left Jerusalem seeking, um, as I said to you, money, and also historically Jews have been hounded from country to country so that they needed a trade that they could take with them, or a profession that they could take with them and be easy to pack and go. So we know that if we look in history, a lot of Jews have been tailors, they've been uh, cobblers, uh, they've been jewelers, and they've been bankers. And I'll just go into that quickly. If you think of tailors, it's quite an easy thing to take a, a, a needle and thread with you. If you think of a, of, of a cobbler, you just take your tools in the suitcase, or, or a jeweler, you just take the jewels with you in the suitcase and you can start your business where you land up. And also, if you think of in those days, in the medieval times, Christians were not allowed to be money lenders. So it opened an opportunity for Jews to do that, and they started the early banks. And we know, we can think of Rothschilds as a, as a famous name within the banking fraternity. James later warns these scattered people that wealth can corrupt. How? Well, greed can lead to exploiting employees. It can lead to spending needlessly in promoting and flattering the rich at the expense of the poor, or implying that wealth means success, and those who struggle are failures. In this community, I've heard many times how there is a divide between landowners and those that don't own property, and this is not right. All land owned belongs to God. We're simply stewards while we're here on earth. And if we are privileged, we comes with a responsibility, not with arrogance. Money can wreak havoc with godliness, as the rich can make plans without reference to God. James warns that we should always add, Gussie, Dio volente, mm -hmm. that is, God willing, to our plans. Other issues with wealth we know well are envy, comparing what we have with others. Jealousy, selfish ambition, pride, boasting, impatience, anger, covetousness, arguments, quarrels, fights, and litigation. Rich people love to sue. Then he talks about the world, living in the world. It is common to try to integrate into the world, isn't it? Into where we live. I don't know if you've noticed people who go through, who are part of your family or part of your, your friend group who leave South Africa to go to Australia or New Zealand and within a very short period of time they come back with a twangy accent. It's as though they've intentionally gone there to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> to integrate, to, to be accepted and not to be seen as different. A chameleon adjusting to the community. It is difficult not to be influenced as followers of the, in the world today. And when I was young I can tell you this well before I was a Christian I might add, that I worked in North Yorkshire where there was a fishing village, and I might have told you this before, where the F word was liberally used. And before I knew it, I was using that as a descriptive word myself. And it was only when I got tensioned up by my wife that I realized it. So it is easy to use unsavory language when you are around unsavory language, and we need to be aware when we go to the club, jock when we need to be aware when we go to the club or the pubs, when we mix with people in this community. How do we fit in? And are we trying to be part of it? We're warned that we cannot be popular with the world and with God. Jesus wasn't. How, if he couldn't get it right, do you think that you could? I've come to the realization that it is better to be respected than liked. And one has to be different in order to make a difference. He talks about the tongue, a major stirrer and problem causer. The same tongue that is used to bless is the same tongue that is used to curse. And uh, James warns against gossip and grumbling and cursing, lying, swearing, and using foul language. He talks about trials. It's actually, in many ways, a preparation for us so that we can know how to behave when trials come, because trials will come. And I can tell you, you think that when you become a Christian that you're going to have less trials. Well, I can tell you as a Christian, you probably have more. James prepares us for those. 
He prays our soul that we prepares our soul that we know how to respond correctly when they come. By displaying the right attitude when we're under attack. By displaying the right attitude when we're tired. When we're financially under strain. The right attitude when we have family issues at home. Understanding that we need to submit and accept that these tests and that we can go through them with him. We're encouraged to maintain our beliefs and not to allow challenges to rock our faith. We prepare, he prepares us for the spirit of humility so that we can keep our focus on the end goal, the reward, if we persevere. There are two types of trials that he mentions, the testing and the temptation. James teaches us the difference. In short, God will never tempt us, but he may test us. The difference is this. You test people with the hope that they will pass the test. You tempt people with the hope that they will fail it. God tests. Satan tempts. Lastly, wisdom. He talks about wisdom. And the book of James is very often compared to Proverbs, so that, it is, so that we know that wisdom is another key theme of the James, the book of James. And it, uh, as, as there are two types of trials, there's two types of wisdom. There's wisdom from above and there's wisdom from below. Wisdom from below we get from uh, experience, from our schooling, from our university, from our work, our jobs, from just life lessons here on earth. And wisdom from above comes from God asking for his advice, trusting in his divine wisdom. Why, lastly, is this letter relevant today? As this was written to the dispersed Jews, how can that really have any relevance to us? Well, it is relevant because we're dispersed Christians. We're not living in a Christian community alone, we're actually living in the world, and we, we, we spread around, and we're living amongst neighbours and people in our community and our, and our circle of influence who don't attend church. We have the same pressures on us today as they did back then. So in this regard, James is completely and utterly up to date. His warnings about wealth, the influence of the world, the tongue, our trials, are all very appropriate. And his advice on being prepared for our tests, testing times, and the idea of wisdom is of great value to believers and those who want to follow in Jesus' path. It is also relevant to us in this community, this Eston community, this Eston church, this year in the 2020 with our Go theme and what we're focusing on, on how to behave in the world and how to behave in church. James focuses on what we should do rather than on what we should say. And he reminds us that Bible knowledge is useless unless we apply it. He encourages God's people to act like God's people and to be aware of the challenges that we have in the world, in this community, surrounded by worldly thoughts, temptations, tests, language, greed, and other influences. For James, a faith that does not produce real life change is a faith that is worthless. So this morning I'd like to challenge you to enjoy the James series and to implement the lessons in your lives. And that is just to go and do it. Amen. Let's go by. Lord, we just thank you for your word. So often, Lord, we, we know what it is that we should do. And so often, Lord, we don't do it. We just pray, Lord, that from this moment, that we will do it. We pray, Lord, that you would call our name, we would hear it, and we would action it. Lord, we, 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 we've been put here as a special time, at this time, in the history of mankind and in this community, with a purpose, a God-given purpose. 
help us to hear our name, hear what it is that you want us to do, and to act on it. Because we can. Because the strength comes from you, not from us. We ask this in Jesus' name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Church, enjoy the James series. I hope you do. Um, I'm quite excited. I think there's a lovely spirit here this morning. For those who didn't make it this morning, I hope that uh, you can make it in the next couple of weeks. But I encourage you to please listen to the James series if you don't come to church. Um, we will be putting it on YouTube so that you shouldn't miss one of the lessons. Um, and I think it's going to be awesome. So thank you. God bless.